The depths of the ocean contain many interesting sounds, as you are about to hear. HPPodcraft.com All right, we are rolling. Ready. On August 20, 1917, I, Karl Heinrich Graf von Altberg Ehrenstein, Lieutenant Commander in the Imperial German Navy and in charge of the submarine U-29, deposit this bottle and record in the Atlantic Ocean. I do so because of my desire to set certain unusual facts before the public, a thing I shall not in all probability survive to accomplish in person, since the circumstances surrounding me are as menacing as they are extraordinary, and involve not only the hopeless crippling of the U-29, but the impairment of my iron German will in a manner most disastrous. <laughs> yeah. His iron German will. Oh, no, I think it's going to fail him. The, but I heard that, it reminded me of that old Ginsu Knives commercial where they say, Ginsu Knives are better than any knives, and they show that sad German chef, and he goes, even our German knives? <laughs> it just didn't occur to him that his German knives would oh. not be as good as another no, culture's no, knives. No, not at all. Well, that, that's an excerpt uh, from, I read by Andrew Lehman. That's right. From H.P. Lovecraft's The Temple. And we're reading it here on the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. Uh, HPPodcraft.com, and I'm Chris Lackey. And I'm Chad Pfeiffer, and we are your hosts. Yeah, so get ready to be blown away by, I think, so far my favorite Lovecraft story. I mean, so far as in our sequential... Yeah. Um, that's one of the things, I don't know, but we get a lot of um, posting on the discussion forum and things where people ask us, like, are you doing this in a particular order? And we are. We're doing this in order of how they were written. Right. So... As, as, as we know. Um, as we know of, yeah. Because yeah, some of these are a little ambiguous about when they yeah. were written, but we... Wrote... But it's not necessarily publication dates no. or anything like that. No, no. So in fact, written. we are going by an awesome website, the uh, hblovecraft.com. Yes. Which we're using uh, their... It's a great um, repository. It's a great repository of information about uh, this writer. Yes, it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, <laughs> I felt like I wanted to say suppository, and I'm like, wait, that's no, not... that would not be the correct thing. Uh, well, so the temple, the temple uh, yes. is a, is another World War One setting. It, uh, it's 1917, and yeah. and this lieutenant commander has dropped a message in a bottle. I don't think it's a love note. No, 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 no. no. So the lieutenant uh, begins to recount what it is he's talking about after this first paragraph. Yeah. He says, uh, On the afternoon of June 18, as reported by wireless to the U-61 bound for Kiel, we torpedoed the British freighter Victory, <laughs> New York to Liverpool, permitting the crew to leave in boats in order to obtain a good cinema view for the Admiralty records. The ship sank quite picturesquely, bow first, the stem rising high out of the water whilst the hull shot down perpendicularly to the bottom of the sea. Our camera missed nothing and I regret that so fine a reel of film should never reach Berlin. After that, we sank the lifeboats with our guns and submerged. <laughs> what, a, what an asshole! I know! <laughs> so actually, that's an excellent <laughs> illustration of that and the Iron German Will thing, that, that this character, the lieutenant, I mean, he really is a character. Yeah. He's got uh, this, he's superior, he's cruel. Uh-huh. I mean, it actually surprised me when I got to the end of that paragraph. Yeah. I thought, you know what, we just, what we really want is the image of that ship going down. Yeah. We don't need to harm the people. But no. then they gunned them all down. Yeah, because he wanted the vi- he wanted the nice video or I'm sorry, film footage of the right. ship sinking and everybody getting away. And he's like, okay, cool, we got the footage. Now let's kill everyone. Yeah, like, but what? There's an odd circumstance that arises because of that gunning down. Exactly. When we rose to the surface about sunset, a seaman's body was found on the deck, hands gripping the railing in curious fashion. One more victim of the unjust war of aggression which the English pig dogs are waging upon the fatherland. Our men searched him for souvenirs and found in his coat pocket a very odd bit of ivory carved to represent a youth's head crowned with laurel. My fellow officer believed that the thing was of great age and artistic value, so took it from the men for himself. How it had ever come into the possession of a common sailor, neither he nor I could imagine. So he found this little, a little, like a statue, a little yeah. statue. It's a, it's a child's head, and it's got like mm-hmm. a wreath around, you know, around right. the Right, and it really creeps everybody out mm-hmm. on board right away. Uh, and they, they ditch the sailor uh, that they found on the top of the ship. And when they throw him over, yeah. people really get People flip out. out. Yeah. The fellow's eyes had been closed, but in the dragging of his body to the rail, they were jarred open, and many seemed to entertain a queer delusion that they gazed steadily and mockingly at Schmidt and Zimmer, who were bent over the corpse. 
The boatswain Mueller, an elderly man who would have known better had he not been a superstitious Alsatian swine, became so excited by this impression that he watched the body in the water and swore that after it sank a little, it drew its limbs into a swimming position and sped away to the south under the waves. Yeah, that's like horror movies. Oh, that's some creepy stuff, man. It really is. He's like just pretending to be dead, and then when he gets in the water, he just swims off. Yeah. Ugh. I was able to be a little less creeped out when I thought of it in a comical fashion. Like, he opened his eyes and then did a backstroke really fast, you know, like, <laughs> away. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's pretty nasty stuff. And it really throws the crew members off. Between seeing that and, and, and that little figurine. Yeah, a little figurine. For some reason, everybody is kind of off their nut at they ha- Yeah, they have yeah. bad dreams that uh-huh. night. Um, some of them are sick. Yep, yep. And, uh, well, the, the submarine commander decides to descend, and they're just going to wait around because there's a they have intelligence that... The, da- the dossier. Yeah, was well, it an American ship? That's it's kind of... either a British or an American ship. Right. It's unclear to me. I, I don't know if it's a real ship, but uh, it was mentioned by agents in New York, and so yeah. they know it might be coming through there, so they descend to, to wait for it. Yeah. And uh, the next morning, everything is worse. The, the boat swing starts freaking out. Mm-hmm. He was in a detestably childish state and babbled of some illusion of dead bodies drifting past the undersea portals. Bodies which looked at him intensely and which he recognized, in spite of bloating, as having seen dying during some of our victorious German exploits. And he said that the young man we had found and tossed overboard was their leader. Yeah, this guy's uh, flipping out. Like, So the, the dead, the people that they've killed, could be a little bit of guilt, you know, like yeah. his mind's playing some tricks on him. A little stuff. bit of hallucination as a result of something yeah 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 in the water could be something in the water something not in maybe maybe it's just in his mind that's that's what our our uh, lieutenant commander believes right and and he takes pretty aggressive action on the boat swain right away they have him whipped yeah wow for for inciting the other men and the other men they've all strongly got together and they suggested that the lieutenant get rid of that little figurine right and well the two those two guys that threw the body into the water are are really uh taking ill and, and, mm-hmm. and getting sick yeah that's right yeah. and uh, um, the men that were sick the night before they whipped the boat swain but the, the and then the next day the men who had been sick they're now just insane yeah that results in some action some pretty even more stringent action yeah he freaking kills the dudes yeah our protagonist shoots them and he, he regrets it or he regrets that there wasn't a doctor to treat them he says <laughs> since, since German lives are precious German lives are precious Ugh. but you know you gotta maintain the uh the crew. Yeah. And it's can't... actually creepy the way Lovecraft writes it because he doesn't say explicitly no. what he does. No, he just kind of implies it. He just says he took drastic steps and those men are no more. Yep. And it's that... like 10 little Indians right now on this submarine. Yeah. yeah people just are going crazy or getting shot or disappearing. And uh, lots of dolphins are showing up around there. Yeah, the lots. U-boat. And they're, ca- they're causing problems. In fact, uh... well, the dossier doesn't show up. And so they're all kind of happy about that. Oh, right. You know? Yeah, yeah. They're because. They're, for some reason, they were really dreading having another like, confrontation. Right. And, and uh, since it doesn't show up, they can go back to Germany. Yeah. Which is probably the best treatment for everybody. But those dolphins, it says... Uh, At noon, June 28, we turned northeastward, and despite some rather comical entanglements with the usual masses of dolphins, were soon underway. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish he'd explain more the, the comical nature of the entanglement. What co- comical yeah. entanglement possibly could have happened that it was, way? It was really quite funny, you know. One of the dolphins painted a picture, so it looked like there was a woman on the beach, you know. And uh, <laughs> and he put it outside the porthole, and I opened it up, and all this water comes streaming in. And, uh, and we're all wet and slipping around. I, all I could do is shake my head. It was delightful, actually. It's very comical. <laughs> <laughs> and then but suddenly uh there's an explosion in the engine room in the middle of the night yeah uh and the engineers who work there yeah, instantly the, killed yeah the dead the engineers are killed and nobody really understands exactly what happened yeah this is really bad uh they have some power and they have the ability to rise and submerge yes mm-hmm. <laughs> that's it they can't really go anywhere no 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 but what happens is uh there's an American ship that uh, right. that comes by, and all the crew's like, we need to surrender so mm-hmm. we can survive, because we're not going to get rescued. Bang! Yep, he kills those guys. <laughs> well, he shoots one of them, and the others quiet down. That's right, yes. Yeah, yeah. but they're, they're, uh, I I think their end is in sight. They're, yeah, he kills those guys. <laughs> and uh, they submerge so that the that American guy. ship can't see them. Yeah. Ugh. That's got to be terrible if you're on the crew of that ship. So frustrating. I, I know there's a certain amount of loyalty that needs to go on, but... 
If I was in that crew, I might be thinking a little mutiny myself. Mutiny, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Especially with all the craziness that's going on. Right, well, especially while they submerge, and unfortunately there's a little more mechanical difficulty, and guess what? Can't go back to the surface. Yep. Can't go back up. They're essentially imprisoned underwater, and now they're just waiting to die. Uh -huh. Which, you know, there's a told-you-so moment there. <laughs> the sailors, and then and that night... The six remaining pigs of seamen, suspecting that we were lost, had suddenly burst into a mad fury at our refusal to surrender to the Yankee battleship two days before, and were in a delirium of cursing and destruction. They roared like the animals they were and broke instruments and furniture indiscriminately, screaming about such nonsense as the curse of the ivory image and the dark, dead youth who looked at them and swam away. I shot all six men, for it was necessary, and made sure that none remained alive. There you go. That's when he kills everybody. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, you know, he's very dedicated to the, uh, the Germans and they will not surrender and they... Mm go down with the ship and honestly uh prince in my opinion a merciful death yeah it's true because i don't know if i if i would ra you know rather just be able to, sitting down in that in that submarine just waiting oh, to die it's horrible oh i can't imagine they're slowly sinking southward and downward oh. yeah well they're picked up by a current yeah. and a current that isn't uh, it doesn't make any sense it's not on any of the maps it's not the dolphins are still following them and as yeah. they keep descending the dolphins are following it as they keep going deeper and deeper and and he's like wait dolphins can't survive at these depths yeah. what's going on and uh the other l lieutenant cleansey starts hitting the sauce oh yeah he starts drinking drunk. I, there was one line i like he said where um he says there's some equipment left for them to use that hadn't suffered from the crazy antics of the other men just <laughs> 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 more like you know they're always making big pastries with the the life preservers and <laughs> getting out the oars and smacking each other's backsides you know it's really crazy it's crazy antics <laughs> <laughs> uh, with those semen that they shot, they expel their bodies and they they, they just drift. Yeah. And, uh, and Clancy, who uh, our protagonist is quick to point out, is not Prussian. No. You know, he's he's not of totally pure German. No, no, no. Uh, ancient stock. So he's freaking out a little bit. Yeah, that's well, how he's he, not. If he was pure German stock, he would be. You know, he could take this easily. Yeah, easily. He would yeah. be nothing to him. They look around uh, the kind of sea life around them with the giant. Yeah, they've got a spotlight, spotlight, a big spotlight that works, and so they're able to look, and they, they see all these, you know... Uh, well, they see those dolphins that you mentioned. Yeah, the dolphins, and, they see other creatures, and... Uh, right, too, and right? and then when they they, dis they get inside of the ocean floor, and uh, Clancy sees something. He was puzzled by one thing, a peak of solid matter, protruding above the ocean bed nearly four feet at its apex, about two feet thick with flat sides and smooth upper surfaces, which met at a very obtuse angle. After a while, he began to shudder, and turned away from the scene as if frightened, yet could give no explanation save that he was overcome with the vastness, darkness, remoteness, antiquity, and mystery of the ocean abysses. Maybe it was the same kind of stone idol we saw in Dagon. Could be, yeah. could be. <sighs> One of the things, too, uh, you know, upcoming when uh, Clancy's going... A uh, little nuts, you know. He's got yeah. After he sees that, it's a it's a it's a pretty quick path. Yeah, he's he's, go, he's he's going nuts. He's flipping out. And uh, one of the things that the, the the narrator he says that I really one of the little quotes he likes because he's you know he's German. He's going to suffer through this and be a badass, you know. Like, <laughs> right. And then he says, uh, "For myself, I was proud, knowing how the fatherland would revere my memory and how my sons would be taught to be men like me." Yeah. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Yeah, that is somebody maybe you'd want to be in in a position of struggle with because he'd have a very practical mind. But if you freaked out even a little bit, he would shoot you yeah, in the face. Yeah, no, you know? I don't know if I'd, I'd like that. I, I think it would, be, it would be tough to maintain composure at this point. Yeah. And, and he's not forgiving in, in, no. in any way. And he especially doesn't like it when Clancy starts screaming, He is calling. He is calling. I hear him. We must go. Yeah. Not good. Not good. Well, Clancy, you know, he starts saying, "Can't you know? I we have to go. We have yeah. to go and kill ourselves and offer our, ourselves up yeah. to the ocean as you know repentance." And yeah, he takes that uh, ivory uh, image out. And yeah, he takes. Saying, the, you know, we gotta go. We gotta go. And he says, "If we don't do this, then we're we're forever damned. You know, uh -huh. we're gonna be we're gonna be cursed. And if we repent right now, we that's our only hope." Right. And uh, and he threatens to jettison them both, but uh, our guy, you know, manages to talk him down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he slowly well, talks him down, but then he realizes, you know what? He's probably going to kill himself, so I'm going to let him do it anyway. Yeah. And <laughs> I but I'm not going to go because I think he's, you know. Yeah. 
you know, he's nuts. And he just figures, well, you know, if I'm going to deal with him, then that's the issue. So so he helps him. He helps him go, go in the thing and it shoots him out. And then he goes to uh, the to the spotlight because he wants to see the body. He wants yeah. to, just to see, you know, to confirm, yeah. to confirm that he dies. And when he goes out and looks, uh, you know, he can't find him. He's like gone. Yeah. What happened? I don't know. Well, he keeps searching the ocean floor with this searchlight, you know, over the, the bit of time. Because the boat's still drifting. It yeah. Hasn't, it hasn't yet hit the bottom. It's and as they're... slowly, right. you know... Descending. As they approach, he, he trains it and he notices the floor descending rapidly as if it's, like, carved out on purpose. Yeah. Into this little valley. And he, he floods it with light. And he sees this kind of ruined city. Yeah. And he, I think he calls it Atlantis, or he thinks it's Atlantis. Yeah, it's marble buildings of weird architecture and temples and villas. Yeah. And you're absolutely right, he says. Uh, Confronted at last with the Atlantis I had formerly deemed largely a myth, I was the most eager of explorers. At the bottom of that valley, a river once had flowed. For as I examined the scene more closely, I beheld the remains of stone and marble bridges and sea walls and terraces and embankments once verdant and beautiful. The dolphins finally clear out. Yeah, they, they take off. They're not they don't have any business. Yeah. None of this stuff. Even though they you know, they stayed with the boat for way too way long. too long. They were under deep pressure and underwater. Yeah, for, they should have imploded. Yeah. Or just suffocated from not breathing. Yeah. You know, like because they, they have right. to go up to the surface exactly. to get air, you know. But the U boat finally settles on a little place next to the valley wall. Well, was it in like a plaza? I thought it was yeah, like, I'm sorry, yeah. you're right, a plaza. Yeah. And from here he sees This temple. The temple. Yeah. The temple of the story title. It's a, it's a giant building decorated with uh, big sculptures of sort of pre-Grecian figures. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. And it, it, it kind of hints to a um, a culture, a civilization that existed before history. Right. You know, like that it's ancient in some way, but it is familiar yeah. in a certain certain way. So he's he basically is just waiting to die in the bottom, in the submarine. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he, you know, he, he decides he wants to, he's kind of beckoned, he's kind of called, not not audibly, yeah, well, he yeah, he can't he, the the temple has a giant door in it and he's training the light on it and he can't see in there. Yeah. Um and uh But it's open. It's like the It's door, open, yeah. The door, the door is open, but he, the way that he is, he can't see exactly what's in there. Yeah. So he decides he's going to check it out. Yeah, he says I'm going to be the first German. He accepts his fate. Yeah. You know, and he says I'm going to be you know what I am going to do though? I'm going to be the first German to check out this ancient civilization yep. and we explore. So he uh puts on the uh the, the deep sea diving the deep suit. sea diving suit and he he goes in and he, he go he goes out to to check it out he goes out to explore with his flashlight and he kind of looks at the you know the sculptures that he finds and ancient coins and and uh, he's really testing his stuff out you know he's he, he's going through the city and he doesn't quite get to the temple no. yet that's his first exploration and then he comes back in everything worked it's awesome and then he decides he's going to explore the temple the next day but uh, unfortunately he finds that he doesn't have enough power so oh, right. he he's going to go out again right, but right. he can't go into the temple because he can't get light in there. Yeah. So he trains the uh, the spotlight on it, and uh, as he looks into the you know the, the temple door just kind of descends into this abyss, and as he looks at it, it sort of fills him with terror, and he begins to understand maybe what Clancy was going through. Uh-huh. He gets back to the boat, and he's considering suicide, and, uh-huh. uh, and he falls asleep, and, and the battery's completely dying. Yeah, he's completely in darkness. And he, he talks about when he when he wakes up and he's in darkness, he, he he thinks that he can kind of see things, but he goes, it must be a hallucination. I must be going nuts. Like, yeah. I can't really see things because I'm in complete darkness. And right. unfortunately, the air is lasting longer than the power does in the battery. So he can still breathe. Yeah. But he can't see anything. But he can't see. But and, then, uh, it, and he does in the darkness, though. He, he remembers, or he, it suddenly occurs to him that the carvings on the temple are the same as the carvings on that little figurine. Right. That went out the porthole with, uh-huh. uh, with Clemsy. Uh, he says, I was a little dazed by this coincidence, but did not become terrified. It is only the inferior thinker who hastens to explain the singular and the complex by the primitive shortcut of supernaturalism. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's a badass, though. Skeptic, because yeah, he even is. in a situation like that, he's still saying, I'm not going to make some crazy supposition about this. That, yeah, that's, I gotta say, it's some, that's a good skepticism yeah. there, you know? He's, he's being, it's like, I don't have explanations, but I'm not going to jump to conclusions and say yeah. that, you know, whatever it is that Clemsy thought it was, or, mm. you know, I, I'm going to just be objective and keep my mind open and see, you know. Until that phosphorescent glow starts exactly. coming through the water. <laughs> and, uh, and it's, you know, he's freaked out because he had taken some bromide or something for his headache and uh-huh. then, uh, puts the glass down and then he kind of sees that the uh, 
that glow is illuminating the inside of the submarine. Uh-huh. And then he's like, I must be hallucinating that. But then he reaches out for his glass, and it's exactly where yeah. he sees it at. So yeah. he knows it's real light. Exactly. <laughs> so where is this light coming from? Yeah, and then there's this sound. It was an oral delusion. A sensation of rhythmic, melodic sound as of some wild yet beautiful chant or choral hymn coming from the outside through the absolutely soundproof hull of the U-29. So he, yeah, hear something. Like a, like a tune, like a melody, like, yeah. a, like a, maybe a siren song. It's just right. calling to him. He's, he's pretty sure he's going insane. Uh, but he, he goes around to look at the city... Uh-huh. I mean, there's phosphorescences in the water, but the city itself is mostly invisible in the dark. But not the temple. What I did see was not spectacular, not grotesque or terrifying. Yet it removed my last vestige of trust in my consciousness. For the door and windows of the undersea temple, hewn from the rocky hill, were vividly aglow with a flickering radiance as from a mighty altar flame far within. Yeah, so there's something inside the temple that's glowing. You know, it's, yeah. it's calling. Ooh, once then, he sees that, yep, that's it. He goes, you know what? I'm I'm done now. Yeah. But what I'm gonna do, since I know I'm gonna die, I'm gonna put on the suit and I'm yeah. just gonna go into that temple and I'm just gonna sit in there and mm-hmm. whatever fate is gonna happen to me, it will happen. Exactly. And uh, you know, his even though uh, his iron German will is folding under this uh, mm-hmm. spell, he he has a good sense to do that. So he writes his account in the bottle. Yeah, he drops wrote, it in there. He drops it, yeah, and uh, assuming that because it, it ends up on a on a shore somewhere. That's right. where we found this bottle. and yeah. read this message, so he uh, shoots the bottle off out into the water, and we assume that uh, he somehow, prepares his suit. Yeah, and, he uh, hears some kind of uh, some laughter, you know, as oh, he's writing yeah. this, and he and he thinks that the laughter must be coming from his his you know delusion and, mind. And then he uh, he gets in the suit and and uh, says, uh, "I have no fear." What I have seen cannot be true, and I know that this madness of my own will at most lead only to suffocation when my air is gone. The light in the temple is a sheer delusion, and I shall die calmly, like a German, in the black and forgotten depths. This demoniac laughter which I hear as I write comes only from my own weakening brain. So I will carefully don my suit and walk boldly up the steps into the primal shrine that silent secret of unfathomed waters and uncounted years. Yeah, that's, and that's the end of the story. That's the end of the story. Oh, man. I gotta say, uh, this this was a... I was riveted by this story. I love it. It's a great setting. It's really creepy. It's got a good character. You know, the, mm-hmm. the lieutenant commander is, is a really interesting you yeah know. he's an actual character yeah but i mean he's got i mean he's not just he's kind of, he's evil obviously and and totally um you know i don't want to say nationalist he's got a crazy yeah. nationalist well now i have some criticisms of the story are that his character is kind of laughable and i will admit that some of the things he says in it are sort of like out of hogan's heroes well, yeah i mean there is some people say well, i remember one of the criticisms about lovecraft is that this is he was kind of a bit of a satire of the german people you yeah know, like, and i think he's trying to be funny on purpose actually yeah when he makes the character say those things right. you have to remember i mean the germans were not a well-liked people at the time that he wrote this no, in 1920 not at all. Not at all. uh and it you know it was the german submarines that brought us into that war right. when they sank the lusitania and killed yep. hundreds of americans uh-huh. and uh you know truth to tell even to this day uh people make fun of the germans i mean when you in this yeah. in the american civilization sure yeah, yeah not not too terribly mean but you know it's it's not there's not a nazi comment far behind when somebody meets a german right person you know what i mean or at least so, in the back of their minds exactly. you know what i mean like and so german, I, nazi and and i think he achieves the desired effect because every time he called somebody an alsatian swine uh-huh. or uh, talked about their impure blood i chuckled i laughed yeah. at him Yes. Oh, yeah. You're definitely laughing at him. But but what's interesting about it is a lot of the things that he does, I understand why he does them. Yeah. You know, war, like, I mean, they're wartime necessities. Yeah. And I mean, not that I personally would do anything like that. Sure. I, I would have. I would have said, yeah, we surrendered. We're all going to yeah. die, and I want to keep my men alive because it's know, not unrealistic. What he did. No. What he did, you know, made sense coming from the kind of personality that this guy had, and and I was. It is really cool that. As much as he's kind of a you know an evil character, he, he he keeps it together in this unwinnable situation. He really makes the most of it. He really does, and that's kind of impressive and yeah. and cool. And he, so it makes him kind of a complicated character. Yeah, I kind of like him a little bit at the end. Sure, 
but he's totally evil. Yeah. You know, by what I... Oh, you know. it's so good. And it's just the way things are revealed and all these other characters. And this is really one of the first stories, because I read this a long time ago, and I didn't think much of it at the time, but, you know, now reading it, I'm older. It's like, this would be a really cool movie. It would. The setting is great, and I would love to see uh, almost, you know, a, a sort of artsy treatment of it where there was a guy walking around in that diving suit in a, in a Atlantis oh, yeah. style city underwater. Oh, yeah. Man, I would pay $10, $13 well, I mean, to see that. Just, <laughs> they um, should make this movie. And most of it's like, it takes place on a submarine and there's yeah. a few places, you know, like having them when they're up, you know, uh, above you know, above the, above water mm -hmm. and they're uh, watching the boat sink you know, yeah. and they go out and they, you know, the kind of camera guy rolling film mm -hmm. just to get it and he's like, okay, great, got that picture. Let's kill everybody. Yeah. It's like guy gets out and sh with the machine gun and starts mowing people Oh, yeah. Down. That would be like an awesome scene. It you know really what I mean? would. Where you're like, well, these guys are terrible. And there's lots of horror movie things in here, actually, that are written into the story. Because when the sailors are seeing their own victims fly past the uh, portholes, oh, not yeah. fly past, but drift past yeah, drift and past. roll over. I mean, I can see, I saw that cinematically immediately. Oh, absolutely. Them, their faces rolling past those portholes. Yeah, it felt and it's very almost, cinematic. It's a character building thing that happens there because clearly there's something supernatural there's a call from below mm -hmm. from that temple and they're sort of drifting through it in that unnatural stream but it's making them internalize some of that and and, and look into their own guilt and mm -hmm. their own horrors of war and, yeah. and see those images it's it's really cool it's great it reminded me of unforgiven the clint eastwood movie when you know he keeps dreaming and seeing the faces of the people he's shot and killed <laughs> Dagon tread over some of the same ground, and Call of Cthulhu will tread over some of the same ground again. Mm -hmm. The big difference here, A, is it's a human society down there mm -hmm. of some kind, yeah. which was pretty interesting. Yeah. And how that society fell, I'm not sure no. what happened to no, it, no, no, but no. It's, it's a prehistory, prehistoric kind of civilization. And also just the setting is so unique. Yeah, I, Ken, Ken Hyten, his book, uh, uh, Tordid Lovecraft, he just mentions that he did a little research, and I, I did some too, and this might actually be the first submarine horror story. Like, Really? Yeah, submarines are pretty new. True, yeah. You know what I mean? And that and, was uh, the first time that they were being used with that many people piled exactly. into them to make war. This thing was published in, uh, wasn't published until 1925, but it was written uh, much, it was, well, written in 1920, but mm -hmm. uh, they think, I'm not exactly sure. Since then, I mean, it, it's a buried alive story, but it's being buried alive in the ocean and slowly which is a totally unique see. thing it like, really is that didn't exist before like yeah. a submarine the, a circumstance where you're with a group of people in a machine underwater uh -huh. like that this type of thing didn't happen this is like because of technology uh -huh. humans are put in circumstances in pretty that, horrific alien yeah. circumstances being imprisoned alone in a vessel that will protect you as you slowly drift towards the ocean floor is a startlingly horrifying oh my god circumstance oh yeah it's, it's pretty neat I, I i hate gushing so I know. so much over but, a story you know, well, but it's it's a fascinating thing putting somebody in isolation and 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 you could argue that some of the stuff is really, truly just hallucinations that these men are experiencing because of some of the trauma they've been through. Yeah. This could easily... I mean, this is one of those where it could be... You know, there's really nothing actual supernatural that happens. Yeah. You know, nobody turns into a monster or, you yeah. know, like, shoots the laser beams out of their eyes or anything like that. It's all could be just people's conscience right. getting, getting to them and then going crazy because of the things that they've done in the past. Yeah. Like that Sam Rockwell movie that's out now, Moon. I haven't seen it yet, but I think he's in isolation on the moon, right. you know, 233,000 miles from from the Earth and starts hallucinating things because of that isolation. And, right. and this is that genre. I believe this is the first story he published in Weird, Weird Tales. Weird Tales, yes. Yeah. And it wasn't published in any of the amateur uh, presses because it was long. This has that feel of a story that, you know, when you're a boy, you would really like, it's a boy's story, because there's adventure on the high seas, and then it slowly turns into this really internal, horrific thing, yeah. you know? But I could understand why um, a popular magazine that publishes fiction for, you know, adventure readers would, would latch onto this. Right, uh -huh. Versus the tree, or, Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. Some of these previous efforts. These I mean, this lands. is real visceral. Like, I just, I mean, I get it. Like, yeah. I'm on board the whole mm -hmm. time. I just... I remember you know, when I first read it, I just was like, oh, wow, oh, neat, oh, yeah. cool. You know, like, whoa, oh, gosh, wow. You know, like, I was just, it wasn't, a lot of times when I read Lovecraft, I have to read things mm -hmm. over a few times before I understand what the heck's going on. And yeah. 
and this time the first read I got it. Like, right. It was it was all there. And uh, all right, well enough gushing. Enough, enough gushing, gushing, but uh, and that's all I really. Yeah, that's all I got to say. That I'm gonna we're gonna wrap this one up uh, really quick here. Um, Next week we've got uh, Arthur German. Arthur, Arthur German, I believe it's pronounced. And uh, well, it, otherwise known as the White Ape, or uh, yes, I think yes. it has a longer title: The Facts it's, Concerning the Family of Arthur German. Arthur G or German and his family. Yeah. The Facts Concerning Arthur German. And his family and uh, their friends, and, their friends, and, and yeah. the next door neighbor that mm -hmm. they don't really talk too much anymore right. after that incident happened. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the, the original title. That's the original that. title. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully we'll hear, uh, we'll hear you, we'll see you, we'll see. Yeah, we'll, you, you will hear us. You will uh, hear us uh, uh, next um, week. Yeah, and keep up the comments, guys. If if we don't get to respond to all of them, we certainly oh. enjoy reading them. Oh and, yeah, uh, compiling love, them, uh, getting the feedback, and just kind of helps us, you know, try and make a, a better show. Yeah. So thanks for all the comments. Uh, the Smart people are, out there. Are picking up. Yeah. It's pretty exciting, and I guess um, uh, another forum uh, is of uh, our podcast has been started um, on another completely different forum, the D20 Radio Forums. Cool. I've started talking about us, so that's really cool. Yeah. I want to yeah. plug Andrew Lehman. Ah, uh, yeah. Thanks again, Andrew. Great to have him back and reading. Does such an amazing job, and um, uh, yeah, I just he's a great guy. I love him. And um, there you go. There you go. That's it. I'm Chris Lackey. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And this is the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. HPPodcraft.com. HPPodcraft.com. Ah!